The program should we'll leave this now as the Oversight Committee is gaveling back in. We continue live coverage on C-SPAN 2. The committee will reconvene. Our next two witnesses need no introduction to this committee. Commissioner Bud Selig and the President of the Players Association, Don Fear, have testified before and are the leaders of Major League Baseball. Don Fear has led the Players Union since 1985 and Bud Selig has been baseball's commissioner since 1992. They both are familiar with our committee rules and, um, and we welcome you today and, as you know, we swear in all the witnesses, I'd like to ask if you would both stand and raise your right hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you'll give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will indicate our witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, we're pleased to have you here, and we're looking forward to your presentation and the opportunity to ask questions. Mr. Seelig, why, why don't you get started first? There's a button on the base of the mic. Be sure it's, it's on. Okay. Good. Mr. Chairman, if it's green, it's on. Yes. Even I. Oh, I see. Okay. Good. I thank, you. Turn red. <laughs> thank you. I would like to thank the chairman, the ranking member, and the committee members for inviting me to testify today. I have a number of people here with me today that I'd like to introduce. First, our advisor, Dr. Gary Green of UCLA one of America's leading experts on performance-enhancing substances. Steve Peserb from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America. Donald Hooten, who has been here before, the head of the Taylor uh, Hooten Foundation. Peter Angelos, the owner of the Baltimore Orioles, who has been at the table uh, for the last two rounds of labor negotiations. Randy Levine, the president of the New York Yankees and Stan Kasten, the President of the Washington Nationals. On March 30, 2006, I asked Senator Mitchell con to conduct a comprehensive investigation of the illegal use of performance-enhancing substances in baseball. I decided to do this investigation so that no one could ever say that baseball had something to hide, because I certainly did not. Baseball accepts the findings of this investigation, and baseball will act favorably on its recommendations. Before I turn to the Mitchell Report, it is important to recall the progress we have made. Baseball now has the strongest drug testing program in professional sports. Our penalty structure is the toughest. We have year-round unannounced testing, including testing on game days, both before and after games. We use the Olympic certified laboratories in Montreal and UCLA for our testing and the day-to-day -day administration has been delegated to an independent program administrator. A whole generation of players has grown up under our strict minor league testing policy which is entering its A season. As a result of all this, Steroid use in baseball today has dropped dramatically from more than 90 violations in the 2003 survey test to just two steroid positives in 2006 and three in 2007. This improvement is similar to what we have observed in our minor league program, where positive test results declined from 9% in 2001 to less than one half of 1% 1 in 2007. Nonetheless, I felt a need to appoint Senator Mitchell to deal with the past. Nothing is more important to me than the integrity of the game of baseball. Baseball needed to fully, honestly, and publicly confront the use of performance-enhancing substances by players. I knew that an investigation would be an extraordinarily difficult undertaking. I knew that an investigation would be painful for all of those associated with the sport. No other sport had confronted its past in such a way. But I knew that baseball must undertake that journey in order to preserve the integrity of our game and maintain credibility with the millions of baseball fans throughout the world. This investigation had a second purpose as well. 
I'm committed to keeping Major League Baseball's program the strongest in professional sports. Indeed, Senator Mitchell confirmed that our current program has been effective and the detectable steroid use appears to have declined. But I knew from experience that the development of a state-of-the-art drug program requires con continual evaluation and refinement. My desire was for Senator Mitchell to provide us with recommendation and insights to help make additional progress in the ongoing battle against the illegal use of performance enhancing substances in sports. I gave Senator Mitchell complete independence to conduct the investigation, to consider any evidence that he deemed relevant, and to follow that evidence wherever it may lead. It is extremely unusual to afford a third party such unfettered discretion to conduct an investigation and to make findings public. Yet I believe that such extraordinary steps were necessary to satisfy my goal of conducting the most exhaustive and cre credible investigation of this subject that was within my power as the Commissioner. As a lifelong baseball fan, I am deeply saddened and disappointed by the conduct of the players and many other individuals described by the Senator in his report. On the other hand, as the Commissioner of Baseball, with the responsibility for protecting the integrity of the game for future generations, I'm optimistic that Senator Mitchell's report is a milestone step in dealing with baseball's past and the problems caused by these dangerous and illegal substances in both amateur and professional sports. Senator Mitchell's report, including his 20 recommendations, which I fully embrace, help point a way forward as we continue to battle against the illegal use of performance enhancing substances. I want to be clear that I agree with the conclusion reached by Senator Mitchell in his report, including his criticisms of baseball, the union, and our players. I have personally agonized over this a thousand times and what could have been done differently, and I accept responsibility for everything that happens in our sport. However, as Senator Mitchell found in his report by August 90, 1998, when the discovery of Andrew in Mark McGuire's locker, we immediately took a number of steps to lay the foundation for bargaining a joint drug program in the 2002 negotiations that included random testing for steroids. These steps included efforts to improve regulation of dietary supplements such as Andrew and the introduction of a steroid education program. In addition, in 2001, I unilaterally implemented a drug testing program in our in minor leagues, which prohibits all Schedule III steroids and required random drug testing. After contentious negotiations in 2002, we finally reached an agreement that led to the first mandatory drug testing program in baseball. I am proud of what we've done, but in hindsight, we should have done it sooner. The compromise we reached with the players on the 2002 drug program was not perfect. As Senator Mitchell reported, it was a necessary first step towards achieving the tough drug program that is in effect today. And as Senator Mitchell recognized, our program has evolved since that time. In January 2005, with the agreement of the Players Association, we revised the drug program to add 17 substances as prohibited substances, including the addition of human growth hormone. We also increased the penalties, penalties for a positive test. In March 2005, with the support of this committee, I sought the Players Association agreement to further increase penalties to a 50-game suspension for first-time offenders, a 100-game suspension for second-time offenders, and a permanent ban for third-time offenders. I have also proposed adding stimulants, including amphetamines, as banned substances. After months of difficult negotiations, the Players Association accepted my proposals in November of 2005. I fully support each of the 20 recommendations for improving our program that Senator Mitchell included in his report. Almost all of his recommendations that do not require bargaining with the Players Association have already been implemented. Just last week, we issued written policies that require all clubs to adopt a uniform written policy for reporting information about possible substance abuse violations and certify to the Commissioner's Office that such policies have been complied with. Require all major and minor league clubs to establish a system to log every package sent to players at its facilities. Require background checks to be performed on all clubhouse personnel and require all clubhouse personnel to be randomly drug tested. 
Also last week, we established a Department of Investigations to deal with the investigation of drug use, headed by well-credentialed former law enforcement officers who are here today, who combined to bring over 50 years of experience. The Department has established a hotline for the anonymous reporting of information concerning the use of prohibited substances and has already made initial contacts with law enforcement agencies to pursue continued cooperation. Although the legal issues are more significant, we will also be developing a program to require top prospects to the Major League Draft to submit to drug testing before the draft. Senator Mitchell also rec recommends certain changes to the joint drug program that clearly require the agreement of the Players Association. In the weeks since uh, the release of his report, we have discussed each of these recommendations with the Players Association. We have already agreed to eliminate the 24-hour notice that drug testing collectors had given to the clubs. We have not yet reached an agreement on the other points. But I certainly will continue to press for an agreement to revise the program to adopt all of Senator Mitchell's recommendations. I am committed to a program that provides adequate, year-round, unannounced testing. As Commissioner, I recognize that baseball is a social institution. Part of our responsibility is to young people. We have been working closely with the Partnership for Drug-Free America and the Taylor Hooten Foundation to educate America's youth and their parents about the dangers of performing enhancing substances. It is essential that we not only investigate and enforce our policy, but that we educate our players concerning the dangers posed by the use of these substances. As Senator Mitchell noted, improved educational program about the dangers of substance use are critical to any effort to deter performance enhancing substance use. Increasing awareness of these dangers of these substances is important not only for the health of the athletes, but also to protect the health of amateur athletes and our nation's youth, who themselves strive to be better on the field of play. As Senator Mitchell described in his report for the past decade, MLB has conducted educational programs for players in the majors and minor leagues during spring training. We have stepped up these efforts in recent years, striving to find ways to make these programs more effective in reaching the players. For example, in 2003, I hired Dr. Gary Green, who's seated right here, former director of UCLA's Intercollegiate Drug Testing Program, chairman of the NCAA's Subcommittee on Drug Testing and Drug Education, and a USADA panel member to develop and implement educational programs and materials on performance enhancing substances. Using Senator Mitchell's recommendations as a guide, we are making even further improvements to our educational program. Senator Mitchell's report reveals there are those who intent on cheating and will continue to search for ways to avoid detection, such as turning to the use of HDH, human growth hormone, which is not detectable in a urine test. I am committed to stop the use of HGH in our sport. Along with the National Football League, baseball is funding an effort by Dr. Donald Catlin, one of the leading drug experts in the world, uh, to develop a urine test for HGH. And we'll be, we will be convening a summit of the best minds in sports and science to develop a strategy to address the use of HDH by players. Just recently, we have joined with the United States Olympic Committee, USADA, and the National Football League in a new long-term program of research on performance-enhancing drugs. Our commitment is for $3 million in funding. When a valid, commercially available and practical test for HDH becomes reality, regardless of whether the test is based on blood or urine, baseball will support the utilization of that test. I am also here to ask for your assistance in this fight. The illegal use of performance enhancing substances is a problem for baseball, but is a social problem that extends well beyond this sport or, frankly, any sport. We welcome your participation in attacking the problem at its source. There are a number of bills that have been introduced that we wholly support, including Representative Lynch's bill, H.R. 4911, Senator Schumer in the Senate Bill 877, Senator Grassley, Senate Bill 2470, and Senator Biden's uh, Bill 70, uh, Senate Bill 2237. I'd like to personally thank Representative Lynch for introducing a bill that would make HTH a Schedule III controlled substance, which I believe is an important legislative initiative. Even prior to the issuance of the Mitchell Report, we had made great strides in reducing the number of players who use performance enhancing substances. I am confident by the adopting uh, Senator Mitchell's recommendations, 
by constantly working to improve our drug program regardless of the effort or the cost, by pursuing new strategies to catch cheaters, by enhancing our educational efforts, we can make additional progress in our ongoing battle against the use of performance enhancing substances in baseball. The lessons from the past serve only to strengthen my commitment to make Major League Baseball program the strongest and most effective in sports. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask that a copy of my entire written statement be made part of the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Selig. The, the, both of your uh, written statements will be made part of the record in, its, in their entirety. Mr. Fear, we're pleased to welcome you, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman Waxman. Did you pull the mic a little closer? Thanks. Is that better? Yeah. Chairman Waxman, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee. As you know, my name is Donald Fear, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Major League Baseball Players Association. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. As I have previously testified before many committees, but specifically this one three years ago, playing Major League Baseball requires talent, drive, intelligence, termination, and grit. Steroids and other unlawful performance enhancing drugs have no place in the game, and we neither support nor condone the use of such substances by players or by anyone else. We cannot change, but we can learn from the past. Baseball's problem with performance enhancing substances was bigger than I realized. We understood that a number of years ago when we began the testing programs. In retrospect, action should have been taken and probably could have been taken sooner. Players Association accepts its share of responsibility for what happened, and as I indicated at my press conference following the issuance of Senator Mitchell's report, so do I. Since our first joint drug agreement in 2002, and in particular since I appeared before this committee some three years ago, we have worked vigorously to rid the game of performance enhancing drugs, and the evidence regarding steroids indicates, I believe, that we have been largely successful. On behalf of the players, I reaffirm the commitment to continue that effort. Today, we believe we have the best program in professional sports. It is a program that members of this committee and other members of Congress praised when it was agreed to and implemented. It is independently administered, administered has state-of-the-art random unannounced testing procedures, and we use the universally acclaimed WADA certified Olympic lab in Montreal to analyze the samples. The penalties, as has been indicated, are the toughest in professional sports. And it is a program, as Senator Mitchell indicated, that we have worked to improve. Over the last two years, even after the 2005 amendments, without any fanfare or controversy, we have agreed on several improvements. Which brings me to human growth hormone. This is a difficult and perhaps a unique challenge. There are currently no valid blood or urine tests for HGH. So what can be done, and what have we done? Well, first, we banned HGH. We've agreed to test for it as soon as a scientifically valid urine test exists. We also have procedures which allow for players to be disciplined, suspended, based on evidence other than a positive test, and players have been suspended on that basis. This is the so-called non-analytical finding. Should a scientifically accurate, commercially viable blood test become available, we will consider it in good faith. But as Senator Mitchell noted in his report, the blood test now being developed may be of limited practical utility. And while the union has warned players for years of the risks associated with HGH and other of these substances, the parties can do more by way of education. We have recently discussed with the commissioner's office having medical experts meet with players early this season to warn of dangers posed by HGH and other bad substances to reinforce that message. But we can't do it alone. <coughs> Abuse of human growth hormone, as I think Commissioner and Senator Mitchell have already mentioned, is not just a baseball problem, it's not even very much of a sports problem. All one has to do to appreciate this is to go onto the Google website, maybe after this hearing, and type in the words, where can I buy HGH? We did this a few days ago, and we got 349,000 hits in a quarter of a second. Ads for human growth hormone and related substances can be found widely distributed in periodicals that everybody reads. Representative Lynch and others have introduced legislation to reclassify HGH as a Schedule III drug, making its treatment comparable to anabolic steroids. 
I assume that appropriate consideration will be given by the Congress to that bill. Consideration might also be given to taking action in some form against the unlawful online sales and marketing of HGH and other of such substances. Finally, as I have previously suggested, perhaps the Congress should examine whether the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, the SHEA as it is commonly known, is being adequately enforced. One of the members on the panel in his opening statement or in one of the questions suggested to kids buying stuff in stores. To the extent that that's true, and I think it is, that means it is available in stores and legally. Senator Mitchell and his law firm were hired to write a report and he served his client well. But I ask you to remember that this was a unilateral action taken by management. As a result, we had no choice but to act as unions are required to act by federal law to represent our members in connection with an investigation with potential disciplinary consequences. If we had done otherwise, we would have violated our statutory duty of fair representation. Even so, while the conduct of the investigation was ongoing, we continued to discuss improvements in our program with the owners. Most of the media reaction to the report has focused on individual players and what they are alleged to have done. That's understandable. But I would ask you also to recognize that the report contains no new allegations of improper drug use in 2006 or 7 when the current program was in effect. In those two years, we administered some 6,500 tests with only five positive results for steroids. I think it's clear our program is working well with respect to steroids, which are capable of being detected. I recognize that many of you hope that I will today endorse all of Senator Mitchell's recommendations. With respect, I ask that you adopt his suggestion that the parties be allowed time to discuss what can and should be done. You can be assured that you have my commitment, both on behalf of the organization and personally, that the players will discuss all of those recommendations. We have already begun those meetings, and they will need to be expanded to include not only staff, but players and the commissioner, as I'm sure he will want an opportunity to express his views directly to the players. <laughs> Unfortunately, the situation has been muddied a bit by the commissioner's unilateral imposition of some of the recommendations. He did so even though these unilateral changes affect our members, and even though we have never declined to discuss any potential improvements. In addition, the suggestion is there that we should once again reopen our bargaining agreement. It goes without saying that no union, and no management for that matter, takes lightly the suggestion by the other party that it should reopen the agreement before the term ends. The contract is the lifeblood of the union. This makes the process somewhat more difficult, but we're committed to pushing forward notwithstanding that. There are some subjects that we intend to raise in addition to what Senator Mitchell has proposed. We want to make certain that every major league club has throughout its organization thoroughly vetted and qualified strength and conditioning personnel. We believe that unproven allegations against players should not be aired publicly and that fundamental protections of due process should be strictly adhered to. And we will suggest that Minor league players who currently do not have a neutral decision maker with respect to an alleged violation of the minor league program should have that opportunity if they wish to challenge a failed test. We also hope to build on one of Senator Mitchell's recommendations. Baseball can do a better job of educating its players and educating the public. And that specifically includes the children that so many of the members here today have mentioned. Telling our nation's kids that drugs will destroy them is only half the battle. And I went to college in the 1960s, and we've been telling people that for all of my adult life, and we're still struggling with it. So perhaps the focus ought to be shifted in addition to that to something else, because the nation's high school athletes and their parents will still aspire to scholarships and want to pursue their athletic dreams. So knowing what to do is as important and perhaps more important than being told what not to do. 
Perhaps players can lead the way in developing nutrition, strength, flexibility, and wellness routines and educating America's youth in that regard. And in an era in which we hear a lot about so-called childhood obesity, perhaps that's a more powerful idea than we can yet appreciate. Let me just summarize and I will conclude. There is no new evidence in the Mitchell Report of steroid use in 2006 or 2007. That does not excuse or condone what happened before that, but it is, I think, relevant to an examination of the steps we have made. Human growth hormone is a problem, both within sports and generally. There is not yet a test, but we will consider in good faith any valid and effective test which is developed. And we've agreed that if compelling evidence exists, a violation of our program can be found even though there is no positive test. We have not refused to discuss improvements in our program. We will not do so here. We will not refuse to discuss them here. We are committed to discussing Senator Mitchell's recommendations in good faith and look forward to receiving specific proposals from the Commissioner. Last, we've made progress, and I think great progress, especially after the amendments we agreed to in 2005. But let me come back to what I began with. In retrospect, action should have and could have been taken sooner. As an institution, the Players Association bears some of the responsibility to that. As its leader, so do I. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fear. To uh, start off the questioning, the chair would like to recognize Mr. Towns for five minutes. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing. There has been considerable discussion um, of the problem that Senator Mitchell had in obtaining cooperation from individual players and players association. Uh, it appeared that there was a wall of silence that uh, uh, people were not allowed to talk or to come forward uh, with information. And in some instances, they said the trainers were not allowed to talk. And then, of course, in some information came forth that trainers were providing um, the steroids. So uh, why would, would there be this code of silence? Do you support this, Mr. Fair? Thank you for the question. I think it's, it's something that came up before and, and deserves an appropriate answer. Um, we're obligated to represent the players in connection with a disciplinary investigation. I think that is why Senator Mitchell recognized in his press conference that what we did was, quote, largely understandable, close quote, and those were his terms. Where you have a management investigation with potential discipline, employment consequences, we have an obligation to give the players appropriate advice as to what that could be and what the effect of what they say is. We asked if discipline would be imposed, and we did not get an answer that it would not be. Further, and this made it very difficult, this process was complicated because there were ongoing criminal investigations in San Francisco, in Albany, and elsewhere, and I assume others that we don't know anything about and shouldn't know anything about. I believe that Senator Mitchell had ongoing relationships with those offices. He's indicated as much. Therefore, we had to advise players that nothing they said was privileged, that if the authorities wanted it, they could compel him to provide it, that there would be possible discipline, and to do something which is ordinarily a union need not do, which is to advise players that they may need to secure individual counsel before they made their individual decisions as to whether or not uh, to speak to Senator Mitchell. Um, it's a difficult situation, um, and that's about the best way I can describe it. Well, what are you going to do in the future to change this? Uh, are you working to change this in terms of uh, uh, the code of silence? Because as long as you have this, there's going to be this problem, and people are going to uh, feel that you're not addressing it in a very vigorous manner. I guess what I can say is this. We would have, and any union would have, obligations to represent their members and to give them appropriate legal advice. We hope that the programs that we are working on will put us in a position so that questions as to whether there is a code of science, silence become uh, a largely not central in any future situation. Uh, if there are future investigations and we have an opportunity to discuss the parameters and the conditions of those before they get started, I don't know what would happen. But that was not an opportunity we were afforded here. 
Um, Mr. Seelig, it's my understanding that Senator Mitchell wanted to get data from players' medical records. For example, he wanted data that would show whether there were trends in medical records that might indicate the level of steroid use. Uh, this information would not have identified individual players. We understand if you're going to identify them that that's a problem. But this information would not have identified individual players. But his staff said that the clubs delayed providing this evidence for so long that it became too late to use it. Well, that was a, uh, I think Senator Mitchell will tell you right from the start, the clubs were remarkably cooperative in every way, and I, I frankly didn't give them any alternative. Having said that, there were some clubs who felt that there were some state laws that prevented them from doing it. There were other people that were concerned about it. In the end, though, we did reach agreement. It took a long time, but I believe in the end uh, we, we resolved those problems. But it, uh, and, and so I think that, that they did get the information that they require. It did take a long time because, frankly, the club lawyers, individual lawyers, had a lot of questions and, uh, and uh, were very difficult. But we kept going until until we we were able to, to satisfy all the all the individual clubs. You have 30 clubs and 30 outside uh, lawyers, and all in different states and state laws are different. Uh, I can remember there were some problems with Florida law and Texas law and other things. So it took a long time to resolve those, uh, Congressman. All right, let me put it this way: Senator Mitchell indicated that there was a tremendous code of silence. Do you support that code of silence? Well, I don't think Senator Mitchell uh, said that he had any problem um, with uh, that so-called code of silence from, from the club standpoint or from our office. I, in fact, he said over and over again, and he's told me over and over again, that we cooperated in every way. I told him the fateful day I called him in uh, late March and said, you'll have a complete cooperation. You go wherever you want to go. You wherever you want to take the, uh, I want you to find out what happened, why it happened, and how it happened. And, uh, and I think that he did, and he did uh, largely because of the cooperation we got. No, I don't, uh, of course I don't support, uh, support a, co a code of silence, not in any way shape, form, or manner. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Mr. Davis? Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Seeley, uh, thanks for moving forward in this. This would have been easy after uh, you reached your collective bargaining agreement to sweep it under the rug, uh, say that's the end of it, and uh, you didn't, and you let the chips fall where they may. And uh, I wish they'd fell fallen differently, and I know you do too, but it is what it is, and we need to move on. I understand from some of the press reports you are weighing uh, some disciplinary action in some cases. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, Do you have any criteria or give us any clue into kind of the, what you're no, looking at? No, I, I can't because I'm the judge in this case, so I'm, I'm sensitive. But what I said on December 13th and what I would say to you again today, um, I, I have great respect for Senator Mitchell and I know his feeling on this subject, but I'm going to review each one of these matters, management and players, on a case-by-case -case basis. Need, I'm getting a lot of information from him. There's other information to get, Congressman Davis, and then I'll, I'll make my decisions as I move ahead. Thank you. Um, I know you, know you stated that Senator Mitchell was given unfettered access to any information that was within your control. Were there any instances in which you or the clubs had denied uh, Senator Mitchell access to information? None that I know of. Okay. Absolutely none. Um, Mr. Fair, what would you have liked Senator Mitchell to have done differently? I think that had I been conducting such an investigation, I might have approached it differently. I might have had some preliminary conversations. I might have tried to see if there were some uh, ways it could be approached other than by someone who is legally a management lawyer doing an investigation. Um, having said that, the biggest gripe that I think I have and that players have is that I would have preferred that at some point before he issued a report, if he was going to write something about Don Fear, that under the circumstances and the seriousness of it, he would have sent Don Fear and his lawyer, if he had one, a letter. I intend to say the following about you. This is why I'm going to say it. This is your last chance to tell me. He didn't do that. He's explained why he thought it was the appropriate way to do it, the manner in which he proceeded. I would have done it differently. Um, have you and the commissioner had any discussions between yourselves, or has it been at the staff level 
about the report and substantially how you would how you're going to proceed from here. Um, Commissioner and I had a very brief discussion at um, out in Arizona right before the new year when we met to talk about another important issue. Um, what followed that was a meeting of staff which occurred last week to begin to set the ground rules and explore what we needed to talk about and what we're going to be trying to do now is figure out when we can have other meetings and that's a little complicated because this is the busiest time of the year and it's hard to get a hold of players. They're negotiating contracts, they're in workout routines and they're spread. But I hope we'll have those meetings put together in the very near future and then we'll begin the process in a more formalized way. Is it safe to assume then that you and the Commissioner and your staffs will take this report and meet on each aspect of it and see where you can come to closure and, uh, and, and have some discussions off camera uh, about implementing this? Yes, I would expect that we would discuss, as I hope I indicated in my, in my opening statement, all of the recommendations and any other matters which come up which would be relevant to those discussions. And, and I would add, Congressman Davis, that we, uh, um, we've done the ones that we felt we should. Uh, right. And uh, I would hope that, frankly, we have this all completed before spring training. Uh, Commissioner, let me ask you, in the Game of Shadows, it was reported that Barry Bond's trainer, Greg Anderson, was either tipped off about when Bonds was to be tested or he was able to figure it out. Um, as I understand it, Major League Baseball looked into that allegation. Um, what did you learn? Uh, how was Anderson able to determine when Bonds' test would occur or was that just an allegation? Uh, well, as far as I know, that was just an allegation. Obviously, um, you know, one thing that Senator Mitchell said today, and I know in the last decade plus I've learned a lot. Uh, these are, this is an evolutionary so process. And, uh, and, and I think with each time we're able to tighten this program and maybe, maybe do something that, uh, that we should have done X years ago, that makes it better. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, that's an allegation. I don't have any evidence of that. But um, it's impossible today. It has been impossible now for quite some time. And um, we need to just continue to strengthen the program so even people can't make those kind of allegations. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, Commissioner Seelig, I want to uh, uh, join the chairman in uh, thanking you. I, you know, a lot of people complain about uh, this committee taking on this role, but I mean, what we've seen done in Major League Baseball has been quite quite a bit, and I think it's been very good. Also, thank you for uh, asking Senator Mitchell to do. This investigation. Uh, one of the things that uh, that concerned me uh, is a few uh, minutes ago, uh, in answering uh, Congressman Towns' questions, he was talking about uh, this whole code of silence. Um, and Senator Mitchell also told us that the clubs refused to allow their trainers to provide information about the steroid use of the individual players. And I understand that the clubs claimed that there was a quote trainer-player privilege. Uh, which I, I've never heard of. Maybe that's a new concept in the law. Uh, this obviously made it much more difficult for the senator to do his job. Are you familiar with that? Uh, is that uh, something new? No, I, I, you know, I've heard the discussion. I, let me just talk about trainers, if I may, uh, um, Congressman, just for a second. I, meet, I started meeting with the trainers and team doctors. I just had a meeting on uh, January 9th with uh, 12 team trainers. And so, I have become very familiar. They're very professional. They, they've, and they have really briefed me as thoroughly as one could the last seven or eight years. Uh, Rob Manfred of our staff is there. Um, they did it again. I, I think that only when there were issues that either the club lawyers felt, uh, and I'm talking about the individual club lawyers felt that they were compromising themselves in, in, in terms that they would have to describe to you. But other than that, every trainer that they wanted to interview, they interviewed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the trainers were, at least told me, they were very forthcoming. So um, I don't think that uh, it, it, unless you have a situation where there is something that the trainer had that was a that would that would have violate some type of, of law. I think that they were very forthcoming. All right, keep your voice up. I want to make sure we hear you. Now, the two of you uh, have a long history with baseball. Priscilla, you've been a, a team owner, a baseball executive for 40 years. Uh, you've been commissioner since 1994, Mr. Ferrer. You, Ferrer, you've been head of player association since 1986 for decades now. 
you all have been the two most powerful men in the sport. Uh, we all agree that we need to focus on the future and, and we will do that, but this scandal happened under your watch. I want that to sink in. It did. I have a very simple question. Do you all accept, you all, you individually, accept responsibility for this scandal or do you think there was nothing you could do to prevent it? Mr. Fear, why don't you go first? Thank you, uh, Representative. Um, I'm thinking a minute because I don't want to, I, I could talk for a long time in response to that question and I know we don't want to do that. Let me simply say as follows. If the question is, did we or did I appreciate the depth of the problem prior to the time that we began to work on it hard? The answer is no. If the question is, should we have? Perhaps we should have. It's a failure that we didn't, and it's a failure that um, I didn't. We can't change that. Uh, there were a lot of things going on, but if your question more generally is, do the individuals who have responsibility for negotiating the agreements on both sides bear responsibility for what took place for a failure to get at it sooner, as I indicated in my opening statement. Of course we do. Mr. Seelig. Sure. I, what I would say to you, as, I've thought, as I said in my statement, I've thought about this thousands of times. I've been in this sport all my adult life. I agonize over that because I consider myself, in the end, a baseball man. In the 90s, you know, hindsight is always very beneficial. Uh, I watch things. I've reread all the articles that Senator Mitchell had. I take responsibility for everything, so let's understand that. I take it I've, for all the good things that have happened to make the sport as popular as it is today, and when we talk about something like this, there's no question about that. I've agonized. But I would also remind you that, and, and who knows how long this has gone on. The Senator said over, over 20 years, which is well before me. I was then the owner of the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, we have come a long way in a difficult environment. My minor league program, Congressman, is going into its eighth year. So all the great young players in this sport have now been tested eight years. And do I wish we had reacted quicker? Should we have? Yes, one can make a compelling case. And I, am, uh, intro I do a lot of introspective thinking, and I'll second guess myself. But to, as far as responsibility, of course, all of us have to take responsibility, starting with me. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Souter? Uh, thank you. And I, I, um, I want to thank uh, Mr. C again, Mr. Fear, for having taken some steps. Uh, and I believe that this report and the follow-up is our additional steps. But uh, I don't know, and what many of us are asking is, is would they have been taken if Balco hadn't occurred? Would they have been taken if the hearings here hadn't occurred? Uh, the leadership part is missing. It tends to be waiting until potentially the law is coming <clears throat> and then trying to fend the law off. Uh, that, let me ask a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Seelig, are, are you looking at gene doping? Am I, I'm sorry, I didn't... Are you looking at gene doping, genetic alteration? Am I look, I'm sorry, I can't... As, as a potential testing question, are you looking at gene doping, gene. genetic doping? Well, we ha we've hired the best experts that we can, and we certainly will look at that. Mr. Taglebu, when we asked him that question three years ago, said this is the greatest potential challenge, and the NFL was looking at this. It raises a, 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 a fundamental question. Are, are you looking at ways that people disguise steroids, such as cream, uh, vitamin B12, uh, what things can be mixed, and will there be penalties for those? Well, let me, uh, again, because this is all an evolutionary process, the answer is yes. We have Dr. Green, who's sitting behind me, is uh, one of the leading experts in the, in the country. We've, we have the two gold standard labs, uh, uh, Christian Nyot, which whom I wish were here today, but isn't, the head of the Montreal lab. And, um, and uh, between Ian Gary Green and all the other experts we have, uh, um, all the team doctors who I meet on a regular basis, we need to continue to be vigilant. There's no question about it. That, that, that as w when we think we have a problem solved, there are chemists working, creating new problems. That are, you, um, are you looking at, <clears throat> I, I worked in 1989 for Senator Coates when we drafted the first drug testing laws of what was allowed for athletes in high school. And <clears throat> what laws have been upheld by the courts, it isn't probable cause because you don't 
No. But it's a potential cause. In other words, if students are repeatedly late for school, if they drive a car, if, if there are certain erratic behavior changes, you can do testing. Are you looking specifically at when you see changes in performance in, in key categories where they're tripling from one year, then you do extra testing? Well, we, we are, you know, we, we have the program now. We test as frequently as we can. If there are reasons to test more, we're willing and uh, able you, to do are that. St are statistical changes potentially one of the reasons? Are what? Are statistical anomalies potentially a reason? Well, that's, a, that's something that the independent administrator would have to do, but, but I, yes. And I, I realize that, I would think that, that, that would, would be part of a labor yeah, agreement. I, would think I think that all would be of us reason. agree yes. that that yes. would be yes. something in due process, but it, it, it is right. a question. But I, I raise some of these questions because the problem with an evolutionary pro, uh, process and, and uh, Mr. Uh, Fear, um, there is a distinct difference here between um, due process of, of penalties, of, of making sure the tests are accurate, and what should be tested. And uh, uh, I'd like that <clears throat> to you to comment on that is every time there's a new variation, does this mean it has to be negotiated? Or in between labor agreements, no. uh, can, can there be decisions of this is being added to the list as long as there's process from your perspective? And the second thing is, why do both of you feel that not only baseball, but all professional sports should be different than the Olympics. What is your criteria for saying that we have this restriction on the Olympic performers, who, who they aren't kids either. Many of them are just as old. They get uh, all kinds of contracts uh, that, that, pay, that may, they may not be paid for performance at the Olympics, but they certainly are paid athletes at this point. In fact, professional basketball plays in the Olympics. Uh, I would like you to finish with that question. Also, what do you do between la labor agreements? Well, perhaps let me begin. Um, to answer your last question first, under the labor law, that when, when you're between agreements, the terms of your pre-existing agreement continue by law unless and until somebody does something. There's a strike or a lockout or a unilateral change or um, a new agreement is reached. So the, the period in between is not an issue. Secondly, with respect to gene doping, I don't remember precisely the audience that I spoke to this was a number of years ago now, but I think I, I told a group and got people sort of sitting up straight that gene doping will make what we see now look quaint. And the reason it will make it look quaint is that if it's done right, my understanding is that people are trying to develop it so that it will be done in utero. And you would be penalizing something for, someone his, for something his parents did at the time that um, he was still being carried by his mother. Um, that's a very serious issue, and I don't pretend to, to have a handle on the ethical or scientific or policy questions uh, that relate to that, uh, but it's a very difficult issue. Secondly, with respect to mixed and disguised substances, uh, all I can tell you is that the laboratory we use believes it can find those. We do add substances in between agreements. If something becomes unlawful under federal law, it's added automatically, as Andrew Steendione was when the law was passed in 2005. And we get lists of masking agents and diuretics and all the rest of it from the lab that uh, they can test for. Um, with respect to due process issues, if I can do this very succinctly, where there's an alleged violation, there has to be an opportunity to challenge that in an appropriate adversary hearing with neutral decision makers, with whatever arguments are appropriate to be made uh, by the individual so that it can be considered to be um, a fair hearing. One of the difficulties with the report we have is that with, if, if Senator Mitchell had said Don Fear did X, used, used this particular drug unlawfully, I don't have a hearing. I don't confront witnesses. I can't cross-examine anybody. The most I can do is be interviewed by the same person who is the investigator and the prosecutor, and in that case would be the judge or the jury. That's inconsistent with most fundamental notions of uh, due process. On the Olympics, I can say as follows. Um, they have to do what's best, what, what they think is best. The athletes are not really represented. We have to do what we think is best, and the test will be whether we're successful 
in eradicating these drugs as we believe the evidence has shown that we have been the last several years with respect to detectable steroids. And I'll give you one example of how it works the other way. This is not my first experience with Senator Mitchell on an investigative panel. He and I were two of the five members on the U.S. Olympic Committee's panel that investigated the Salt Lake City bribery scandal and the report that was written. And we made a series of recommendations that the USOC adopted in large part as to how they should change their practices. Suffice it to say, the IOC had enormous difficulties with our even raising the issue to them. They did make some changes, but grudgingly. Cultures are different. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Mr. Tierney? I was going to answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here today. I want to uh, take up on a, a train of thought that I had in the earlier session with uh, Senator Mitchell, and that is that uh, we had asked uh, the League for some information on uh, exemptions uh, or from the drugs on that. And uh, just looking at the raw numbers here, in 2006, there was a total number of players uh, that were subjected to testing was 1,356, and there were 35 therapeutic use exemptions granted. Uh, in of those, 28 were for ADD or ADHD medications. In 2007, that number jumped significantly. Of the 1,354 players tested, therapeutic use exemptions granted were 111, of which 103 were for ADD or ADHD medications. Now, uh, that would make that almost eight times the normal adult usage in our population amongst baseball players. Uh, does that have any significance to either of you gentlemen? Is there something that we ought to be looking at? Have we set up procedures to look for anomalies like this and then determine what we're going to do about it? Let me um, uh, respond to that, and I appreciate your asking the question since you did raise it with Senator Mitchell. Thank you for doing so. Um, first of all, therapeutic use exemptions are granted by the independent program administrator. He must have, in order to do that, appropriate medical documentation from an appropriate doctor who's conducted a legitimate examination, and he is free to question that individual to secure more recommendations or any of the rest of it. He is um, a physician. He is expert in sports medicine. To go, oh, and I believe that Senator Mitchell did interview him with respect to the procedures he utilizes to determine whether therapeutic use exemptions will be granted. Uh, no problems were reported by Senator Mitchell in that regard. As to your more Can general I question. I think the problem with that is Senator Mitchell didn't have the information that we have, he could ask him about his procedures, but he didn't right. have this data to look at. I'm coming to that. As, as to your more general question, um, I don't personally, I'm not familiar, I accept what you say about the use in the adult population. I suspect from some personal exposure I've had to hyperactive kids that the use of such drugs among young adults by prescription may be significantly larger than it is in the general adult population. Having said that, I don't know that to be true. What I would expect is that if Dr. Smith believes that we have anomalies which should be investigated and looked into more closely, he would do three things. He would tell us that. He would look into it more closely with the doctors granting the exemptions and the players. And if he thought there were changes that should be made, he would so recommend them. And as Senator Mitchell pointed out, we have not had a recommendation that he made that has not been adopted. I just, if I can add to that, because I've asked the same question over and over. You have to start with two things here. Number one, the player gets uh, a prescription at the local level. To player playing for the Chicago Cubs and the Milwaukee Brewers. That doctor there gives him that. Then Dr. Smith reviews all that. So they've been through, it's been through two levels of, of, of medical research. Uh, I mean, of, of, of med the examination and why and how. And, and if Dr. Smith accepts it, I guess that we do too. It's within the limit of, of the adult population, uh, the overall population. It's a little higher, but it did go up, and we're reviewing that right now, trying to break down exactly why it happened and how it happened. Interestingly enough, in my meeting with the trainers, that was one of the major subjects last week. Why? How? And everybody has a di had a different view of it, and I was fascinated by that view. So we just need to keep, to keep working at it. And I guess hopefully after we uh, conduct our review with all the team physicians and Dr. Smith and all the team trainers, we'll be able to give you a better answer to that. I'd like to, just out of curiosity, is it perceived to be in a performance enhancement, the ADD drugs? Are they perceived to be in a performance enhancement to begin with? Oh, sure. Well, if they are not 
appropriately medically prescribed, yes, and, and oh, they're prohibited. Yes. That's right. I mean, remember, it has to go, as I said, to two levels of doctors. Uh, our independent is the last one, but, but you would hope that a doctor in Kansas City or Philadelphia or anywhere else is only prescribing it if he feels it's medically necessary. Well, I take it from your, your comments, Mr. Seely, that you do have a system set up to look at anomalies like this, and then you are, in this instance, looking into it and in Absol other situations. If you no saw question junk, about you would it. Absolutely. Well. This is one that needs to be dissected. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Mr. Burton. Chairman, I just, I just have one question of Mr. Fear. Uh, I was interested in, in, in uh, your answer about uh, due process, uh, and I wondered you probably talked to a number of the players. I wondered why some of the players didn't come in. Was it because they had not been apprised of the allegations against them and they thought if they went in they would immediately be looked upon in this media age as guilty of something by virtue of the fact that they showed up? And is that why they declined? And so they were darned if they do and darned if they don't because if they went in it would look like there might be something that was against them. And if they didn't go in uh, ultimately, uh, when the report came out, they would be uh, uh, judged uh, guilty before uh, they had a chance to defend themselves. I guess I, I would have a couple of responses to that. Uh, first of all, because we are giving legal advice, uh, we wanted to make sure that an attorney retained by the Players Association to give that advice was conversing with the individual players about these subjects, and so it wasn't me that, that did that. Having said that, I think that it is probable that there were some players that had some concerns in those regards. My guess is, because I don't know what the basis of individual decisions were that were made by the players and their individual counsel, but my guess is that it was the totality of the circumstances that was involved. It was the investigation, possible employment consequences, general reluctance to get wrapped up in something, concern that they didn't have precise information as to what the allegations were uh, before they went in, worry about various criminal investigations that were ongoing, even which they might get called, even as a witness or somebody that talked to Senator Mitchell, and the lack of, of privilege that uh, would apply, added to the fact that there's no process to resolve in any meaningful way what happens after an allegation is made. I suspect that it would be very difficult for most attorneys to recommend that their clients go in under that basis. Let me just follow up real quickly. In the future, if there's an allegation against a baseball player, do you think it should be changed so that they're apprised of the allegations against them before some kind of report like this comes out so they have a chance to prepare and to be able to defend themselves? Yes, I would hope that one of the subjects that we would discuss um, in our upcoming meetings would be whether we can agree that in the future there will be an opportunity for um, uh, a, a procedure to challenge in a formal way and some sort of a neutral to make a decision before matters are raised publicly. Whether players would take advantage of that would depend on the individual player and the individual circumstance at the time and without each decision is going to be fact bound. Thank you. Uh, I yield Thank to you, Mr. my balance to uh, Mr. Shays. Did you want to go further? With your no. no. I just said I appreciate your question. I thank, thank the you. gentleman for yielding. Uh, Mr. Freer, you continually say we have to do what is best, but it's clear to me that uh, involves what is best for the players. Uh, you have an obligation you feel as the representative of the players. What I want to ask is what obligations do the players have and Major League Baseball Players Association have to the fans and to the public at large, uh, particularly our young people? What are the obligations there? I think that I can best respond in, in the following way. They have an obligation, and this is not necessarily in order of priority, but they have an obligation, first of all, to comply with the law and not suggest to in, in, anyone that they're different and don't have to or shouldn't have to or that it's okay. Secondly, that to the extent they can, they should be in a position to help educate people both as to what not to do, but as I said in my other statement, perhaps it would be better to as to what they should do. Third, in as a group, you can make certain statements. As an individual who is called before a tribunal or an individual or who may be challenged with wrongdoing, that individual faces an entirely different set of circumstances and theoretically facts of which he has some knowledge and people making accusations. 
What he should do in the context of that case is going to depend on what the situation is, what the best advice is he can have, and what he ultimately decides to do. <clears throat> I'd like to ask the same question to you, Mr. Selleck. What obligations does Major League Baseball have to uh, the public at large, the fans, the public at large, and to uh, young people in particular? Congressman Chazer, we have an enormous responsibility. I, there isn't a question. I have often said in my now long career that uh, we're a social institution. We have enormous social responsibilities. One of the reasons that I decided to do the George Mitchell Report and I thought long and hard about all the consequences, various people that could do it, is that I felt that we had an obligation to, we had we have toughened our program, we had taken care of the present and future, but we had an obligation to go back and have somebody take a look at what happened so it would be a road map for the future for people who came after me and for other people, but we also, I felt, had an obligation to our fans. The, there is no question that the, the impact of this sport, socially in this country, is enormous, and that is really our primary responsibility. So that's why I, I did the Mitchell Report, even though there were a lot of people on all sides who didn't like it, I didn't like somebody doing it. I felt that we, given the fact, I never wanted anybody to say, what were you hiding? Why wouldn't you let somebody look at it? And I heard it when I was here, and it was a very, it was an absolutely very fair concern. And I finally said to myself, this is gonna be a painful journey, but it's a journey we're going on. And I would do it again today. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Before I recognize Ms. Watson, who will be the next questioner, uh, the two of you talked about the medical exemption issue and you're reviewing it. Would you keep us apprised of your decision making in that area? Absolutely. Mr. Yes, of course. Yes. Ms. Watson. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the Commissioner and Mr. Fair for being as uh, forthcoming as you have been. And um, I know that one of the concerns with the uh, Mitchell uh, report was that uh, they felt that there was not uh, enough off-season testing. And I know the two of you have grappled with, you know, how do we meet this issue head on? So, and according to Senator Mitchell, baseball only conducts uh, 60 off-season uh, tests each year. And this means that the average league baseball player will go their whole entire career without being tested even once in the off-season process. And so first to the commissioner, Mr. Selleck, uh, do you agree with Senator Mitchell that more off-season testing is needed? And I'll ask Mr. Fear the same thing. And uh, I'd like to have you go into your views about uh, what actually is needed? Yes, I, the fact of the matter is that if you were to ask me today uh, what would I do if I could change the program today, we need more testing, more year-round testing. There is no question in my mind that that would strengthen the program. So I not only agree with Senator Mitchell, but I agreed with it even before Senator Mitchell uh, made, uh, made, uh, made that observation and did his uh, investigation. So yes, I, there's no question that more testing and off-season testing would be very helpful. Uh, for, for my part, um, one of the things which came out of the Mitchell report is that, that players were told the number of off-season tests. Prior to that time, they didn't know how many there were going to be. They didn't know whether there would be few or there would be many. That would, as far as they knew, that was going to be up to the people that, uh, that draw the names out of the hat to determine um, who is going to be tested. One of the things that Senator Mitchell suggested, and I may not have this precisely right, I didn't review this part of it uh, uh, overnight, was that perhaps the number of tests in season and off season in terms of how they are divided should not be static and should be changeable and, and all the rest of it. And that probably bears some examination. That goes right to um, something that uh, Jeff Kent, uh, who is a second baseman, as you know, for the Los Angeles Dodgers and a former most valuable player. And he stated that uh, baseball never conducts tests, uh, testing in the post session. And I understand 
that there was some testing in 2007, but it was limited. And so can you give me an estimate of uh, the testing in 2007 and uh, what you feel as to whether it's sufficient or not? Sure. I, um, I can get the precise numbers after the hearing okay. if, if there's an interest. But we began testing in the postseason, I believe, in, in 2007. And we do what um, is traditional in team sports. As I understand it, a number of people from each team are, are tested during that process. I don't know the precise numbers, but one of the improvements we made since 2005 was to increase, it was to provide for testing in October. Yes, we did test. Uh, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, I'm told it was both 06 and 07. Yeah, we did test in the postseason the last year. That is correct. Uh, it appears from what the two of you have said that uh, the players possibly are under a misunderstanding and they feel that there is no opportunity for postseason testing. How would you comment? Well, I, I hope they're not under that misunderstanding because if they are and they use drugs that they shouldn't, then the likelihood is that they're going to be caught by the, by the testing procedures. But part of my job is to try and make sure that players understand what the rules are and if there's been a failure there, that's one of the things we can emphasize in our spring training meetings. And probably they ought to be under more scrutiny. If this is something that's pretty widespread, I would say leadership needs to inform them that random testing after the season is uh, something that you're going to see happens. And uh, I would hope that uh, we will get word of your follow-up and postseason testing prior to another hearing like this. And thank the two of you for your input. We appreciate thank you. it. I yield back my time. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Watson. Uh, Mr. Mr. Lynch? I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Commissioner and, and Mr. Fair, I just want to say that at the outset that uh, a lot of progress has, ha has been made. And I, I want to congratulate you both on that. I remember the last hearing, uh, we were looking at a collective bargaining agreement that uh, actually allowed a player to leave in the middle of his drug, his urine test, and leave unmonitored and then come back an hour later uh, for no apparent reason. Uh, it also allowed players to pay $10,000 fine rather than be suspended, which I thought was a slap on the wrist. All that has changed. And it's changed because of the collective bargaining agreement and the whole collective bargaining process that you've engaged in. And I want to congratulate you on that. And I, I think it needs to be said here publicly. But uh, look, I, I'm a former union president. And uh, I've negotiated a, a fair number of contracts myself. And I always viewed, even though I was representing iron workers who were a heck of a lot uh, less, less well paid, I guess, than, than the union members you're, you're representing, I always felt that the uh, well, I was always one of the biggest advocates for a drug-free workplace. And I felt that was my uh, rightful position, uh, representing the best interests of the people that I represented. And uh, I, I do want to just note one thing. Uh, this Mitchell report, which was well done, did note one bit of new information. And I, and I think it deserves recognition by both of you. And that is, he said that in the report that while steroid use was down considerably, and that's, that's a good thing, he said HGH is on the rise. It is on the rise. Now, <clears throat> I, I think that deserves some type of acknowledgement in your agreement. And I, and I respect the sanctity of the collective bargaining agreement. But here's, here's information we didn't have when you sat down. And uh, I know this current agreement goes from 2007 to 2011. December of 2011. That's the next time, unless we reopen this agreement, that's the next time we're going to be uh, presented with an opportunity to change the drug testing protocol in this agreement. And, uh, you know, I, I know that uh, Gary Wadler testified last time we were here about the fact that HGH blood testing was used at the Athens Olympics in 2004. And, uh, uh, you know, that's the World Anti-Doping Agency, a fairly reputable outfit regarding drug testing. And uh, I, I, just, uh, I just think there's a, there's a way here uh, to, to get at that. We know it's on the rise. We know it's being used in the sport. We've got to get at it. Uh, so I'm going to ask each of you. Uh, we know it's a problem. 
there's some testing protocols. Oh, and, 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 and I just want to get at, I, I understand Mr. Fair's comments earlier on. You're saying there's no valid uh, testing protocol right now that's commercially available. I think Mr. Wadler would, Dr. Wadler would disagree with that. And you're saying that you don't want to test for it until something's out there. And here, here's my response to that. Number one, uh, you've banned it in your agreement. It says HGH is a banned substance under your current collective bargaining agreement. But you're not testing for it. All I'm saying is test for it now. Test for it now. Get the blood samples. Okay? And when the test becomes commercially uh, effective, if that's, your, if that's your, uh, your objection, we'll be able to test these retroactively. And I, and I bet you, I just, I just know that these players, if they know they're being tested for HGH, you'll see the incidence of use drop just like you did with steroids when we started testing for that. Commissioner. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Congressman Lynch. If I can just add, I, I don't disagree with much of what you've said. Uh, our, our deal with the USOC, which you probably read about last week, is that's exactly what this is about. We, there's no question, that, and I d agree with Senator Mitchell, the use of HDH is on the rise. In my meetings with trainers and doctors, frankly, I, that's a subject that I spend a lot of time on. I get what I would say to you today is that according to our experts, one of whom, Dr. Green, is sitting right behind me, uh, there is no com commercially available test today. Maybe there will be one in two or three months. I can speak from our perspective because I am so concerned. I'm frustrated by HDH and a lack of a test. I, it has been, we, you know, we're, we're, we're funding Dr. Catlin with the National Football League. We've done a lot of other things. Uh, there, I cannot tell you my level of frustration about this. So if there, be a, if there comes a test that's available, um, as I said in my statement, I think that I, we would have to have very meaningful, expeditious discussions because I believe that if we're serious about it, and I think we all are, that, that we would adopt that test. And we'd adopt it as soon as it's available. So uh, as for the... Uh, the storing of these things, um, I'm, you know... Commissioner, I guess you're missing my point. I'm saying that if we, we take the samples now... I'm going to get to that right okay. now. Okay. According to the people that I've talked to and we've talked to, Dr. Green, Chris Nyat, the head of the Montreal Laboratory, there has been a feeling that storing samples is not practical. I'm not a medical expert. Frankly, if there was a way to do it, I'm not adverse to doing that. But I've taken the best medical advice that I can get from people, right. and they tell me that, at least for the moment, uh, that is not the way to do it. Look, I, as, if I really felt that there was a way to do it, and it would really do what you say it would do, and I believe that may be right, of course we'd do it. So. I, I have to be guided by, uh, by our, the head of the, the labs and everybody else. And if, 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 if they think it's doable, then it's something that we will seriously consider. Absolutely. All right. Fair, fair enough, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Fair? Uh, thank you. First of all, um, uh, I don't know personally whether Senator Mitchell is right that players have switched to, to HGH because we had uh, workable testing for steroids certainly wouldn't surprise me. That's an old story in athletics where people move on to the next um, available drug. And I'd indicated in my testimony response to other questions things which um, I think we can do about that. I am not aware of any test or any protocol that says you can store and then test at a later time. Um, and it troubles me to do that. And I would just remind everybody, although I don't want to bring unnecessarily someone else into a hearing, we had issues, we, meaning this country, had issues with stored samples that were looked at years later in Lance Armstrong's case in France. So all I can tell you is that when a scientifically valid and effective test is available or some other procedure that the medical experts tell us we can rely on, then we have to look at it very hard and we will. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Shays. Thank you. Um, 
I feel Major League Baseball is in a different place now than 2005. Uh, you do have three strikes and you're out, except for the fact that you can petition two years later. And I'm going to want to know why you should be able to petition two years later uh, after you've had that third strike. Um, I want to know specifically, do either of you see a difference between cocaine and heroin, uh, heroin use versus steroids and enhanced drugs as it relates to baseball? I'll take that first since Bud took the last one. Um, I think yes in, in one very specific way. Um, and that is that one category of drugs is can or is alleged or is believed to affect the play of the game on the field and the others do not so far as I know. And that is a significant difference and it suggests why you can have different approaches to that kind of an issue. Um, Could I just respect leave, it, leave it right there? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Mr. Uh, Commissioner, do you have the same answer? If it is, I'll go to Well, the yeah, yeah. Look, the, the cocaine and that, uh, by the way, this sport had a terrible cocaine problem in the 80s, and fortunately there was no testing as a result of that. But, uh, you know, the steroids and HGH are enhancing as opposed to the others which are recreational. Okay, so basically you see a difference. And so what I get to is the issue of collective bargaining. Um, I don't know how you have collective bargaining uh, for cheating. And um, that's what I wrestle with more than anything else. I don't know, Mr. Freer, how you, how you can even make the argument uh, in the sense that your, your players should be allowed to cheat once, twice, three times before they're kicked out. It just, it, it just, it's inconceivable to me and I think to other people as well. So tell me why a player should be allowed to cheat three times. Best way I can respond, Congressman, I, I suppose in, in the short time we have is, is as follows. Um, under the law, we're supposed to negotiate all terms and conditions of employment. Discipline and increasing levels of discipline for repeat violations is a traditional method which is utilized in collective bargaining agreements all across the country in sports and out of sports and has been for, for longer than I've been alive. Um, in our case, the way I look at it is we want to have a program which stops the use but does not destroy if you can reform people and, and avoid having repeat problems um, th their careers and therefore we think that this works. The commissioner proposed three strikes as you know back in 2005. But why should we agreed someone to be allowed to reform when they're cheating? In other words, um, that's what I don't, I don't get. It seems to me it's a different kind of drug. One, they're taking because they want to cheat, they want to have an advantage. I, 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 I don't know about its addictive nature, but it strikes me as a huge difference. It would strike me then that your argument could be, you know, the Black Sox of 1919 should have been allowed uh, three strikes before, uh, before they were kicked out, because it's the same difference, and it's the same thing. Th that's kind of well, how I'm seeing it. Mr. Selleck, how do you, how do you respond? If I can, I'll, I'll answer from my... Uh, Look, we have today, the three strikes round is the toughest program in American sports. My father always used to say to me, nothing's ever good or bad except by comparison. Having said that, in a perfect world, Congressman Chase, I, I would like a tougher program. But this is a subject of collective bargaining. And this is where we are, and this is the best that we could do, and we came a okay. long way. I hear you, and I appreciate what you did in the minor leagues. Um, for taking a stronger action. Uh, and Mr. Freer, I understand you're, you're going to speak for your, your, your players and you're going to represent them to your best of your ability. The consequence is, though, that you are really saying to the players that they can cheat three times. Um, and you're arguing that they should be allowed to. That's the way I'm left with it. I, I think you and I have a, a disagreement on that, uh, Congressman, but I can assure you of this. I can't envision the player, and I've never met him, who believes that the public disclosure of a steroid violation is something which is anything other than of enormous consequence. And maybe that's why we haven't had repeated ones. I hope we don't. If we do, it'll be tougher. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shays. Uh, Ms. Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, in the, the Mitchell report, details in um, a number of places, incidents in which club personnel 
appeared to have been complicit in at least enabling uh, the violations of some of the rules. And in one case, we know or we heard that um, a club personnel actually returned steroids to a player after he had found it. We've talked about the penalties being imposed upon the players for violations. What plans do you have to hold club personnel accountable for incidents in which they may be complicit in the violation? For the same reason that I um, said that I, baseball is a social institution with enormous social responsibilities, I plan to evaluate the club personnel in the same way I'm doing the players. Uh, there, there is no question that um, if if there were club personnel, and there have been some pretty serious uh, accusations there, if those people uh, uh, are guilty of doing what was said they were doing, they will face discipline, and very significant discipline. Okay. Thank you for that. I'd like to pursue a discussion I had with um, Senator Mitchell about the issue as to whether we really know enough about uh, the effects of these substances we're talking about. And I, again, I wanted to make a distinction between the legality issue and the competitive advantage issue. I'm talking strictly about the competitive advantage issue. Uh, we've heard a lot about, you just mentioned, the, the distinction between cocaine and, um, and um, steroids. And you said one's performance enhancing and one's not. And yet, as I said, there, there's some evidence at least that there is no, at least statistically, there's no competitive enhancement. So my question is, do we really know enough to say that taking steroids or HGH improves a player's competitive position any more than chewing tobacco does, any more than chewing on sunflower seeds does, or anything else they might put in their body to relax them or to stimulate them? I mean, I, I ate enough boxes of Wheaties as a kid. I know Wheaties don't do it. But, uh, but do we have enough evidence to really make these type of determinations? Um. I'm sorry, the question was directed to you. My answer to that would be yes. I think there is enough evidence that using performance enhancing drugs um, gives a player an advantage. I think there's, I, I've talked to a lot of doctors, I've talked to our own people, I've talked to a lot of team doctors, I, and I've talked to trainers about it. I, I, yes, I, I think there is, and, and I'll tell you what else it does. When you think about it, and and um, it it attacks the integrity of the sport. You have some people doing something that others aren't. And even if one could make a case uh, that well, really it doesn't help, I happen not to agree with that. And I think there's a lot of medical evidence that would support that. Uh, the fact of the matter is that that's something you just can't tolerate. And uh, as I said to Senator Mitchell way back when, the day I asked him to, I wanted him to create a road map. That was my reason. A road map which will show us, which will take history and using the way I love to use history to, to, to try to educate us for the future. And you, you get into an integrity problem. And so I, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I don't have a scintilla of doubt that, uh, that the use of performance enhancing drugs is a very serious matter for this sport at, at its core, at its core. Its core. Mr. Fear, do you have the same conclusion? Um, yeah, let me say a number of things. Um, first of all, I, I approach it this way. The use of such substances in a fashion not authorized by law is unlawful. That's where you start. Mm -hmm. Secondly, players use it for a lot of mixed motives, including to recover and to help train better, as Senator Mitchell indicated. But undoubtedly, there are players, and perhaps most of them, who use it because they believe it has such effects, whether it does or not. Third, we did a study jointly with Major League Baseball about a decade ago as to whether or not androstenedione built muscle mass. And what the study indicated, if I remember it correctly, I haven't looked at it in a long time, is if you take dosages and the amounts recommended on the bottle, Nothing much happens. If you take it in much larger amounts, however, you do build muscle mass in a fashion which would otherwise have to be duplicated by more traditional methods of exercise um, and diet. Fourth, and to go back to the kids issue, regardless of its effect on adults, and we do draw distinctions between children and adults in this country for a lot of issues, but the evidence is clear that it's bad for um, children. And that's something we need 
to pay some attention to. The last thing I'll say, and, and I want to stress that I am saying this because I'm musing a bit in response to your question. I am not saying it because it represents a position of the Players Association or even the one that I advocate. But I have wondered, given the anecdotal suggestion about ability to recover better if some of these things are used, whether in fact there are therapeutic doses which could be administered to people um, who have elderly people with broken hips. I mention that because we had an, an experience in my family with that recently that would be helpful. And I don't know whether any of that research has been done. Um, but that's amusing on my part. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair wants to recognize himself uh, to follow up on some of the points raised. Uh, Commissioner Selig, I want to ask you about the Balco scandal. Uh, Senator Mitchell explored this scandal and the role of the management of the San Francisco Giants in great detail. What he learned provides a case study of everything that went wrong with baseball management's approach to reports of steroids use. As early as 2000, the Giants trainer Stan Conti expressed concerns about the presence of Greg Anderson in the Giants locker room, but he received no support from general manager Brian Sabian to have him removed. In 2001, another Giants trainer, Barney Nugent, raised concerns about Anderson with Kevin Hallinan, the head of baseball security office. And Mr. Hallinan promised to do something about this. He did nothing. In 2002, Stan Conti reported to Giants general manager Brian Sabian that he believed Greg Anderson was selling steroids to players. Mr. Sabian did not confront Mr. Anderson or Barry Bonds about these allegations. He did not take steps to have Mr. Anderson removed from the clubhouse, and he did not report Conti's concerns to anyone in the Giants organization or in the commissioner's office. Finally, in September 2003, a search warrant was executed on Mr. Anderson's residence, and it became public that Anderson was under investigation for steroid distribution. Only then was Anderson barred from the Giants clubhouse. And even at this point, Mr. Sabian never reported to the commissioner's office that anyone in the Giants organization had raised concerns about Mr. Anderson. Uh, commissioner Selig, uh, Stan Conti did the right thing here. He warned Brian Sabian repeatedly about Anderson's ties to steroids, but Mr. Sabian never did a thing about it. Instead, he seemed to go out of his way to allow the suspicious behavior to continue. Uh, how do you account for Mr. Sabian's behavior, and at the very least, should Sabian have reported this suspicion to your office? Well, it's, uh, it's a subject that I'm, I'm familiar with, uh, Mr. Chairman, because I ran a club for almost 30 years, and I understand the sanctity of a clubhouse and who should get in and should not get in. There should not have been anybody in clubhouses. We now have done that. You know, we sent a trainer's letter out in 2003 um, telling people that the, the clubhouses now would be, would be carefully watched. They are. We've changed all that. But this is one of the matters that I, frankly, is under review and under discussion. I, you've raised a very valid point. It's a point of uh, great concern to me. Uh, the fact of the matter is why anybody's ever in a clubhouse who, other than the trainer, is beyond my comprehension. And I have, a, I say, I have 30 years of practical experience. Do you think so, Sabian should have reported this to the commissioner's office? Of course. Okay. Senator and Mitchell of course, also. But I, I, I don't really want to say any more because it is a matter that okay. I have under review. But the answer to your last question is yes. Okay. Senator Mitchell also interviewed Giants owner Peter McGowan about his actions with regard to reports that Barry Bonds was using steroids. McGowan told Mitchell that he asked Barry Bonds this question in 2004. Quote, I've really got to know, did you take steroids? Mr. McGowan said that Mr. Bonds admitted that he had taken substances that he later found out to be steroids. According to Senator Mitchell, two days after his interview with Mr. McGowan, Mr. McGowan's lawyer called and said that Mr. McGowan had misspoke about this conversation with Mr. Bonds. Commissioner Selig, what do you think was going on here? Do you think the Giants owner had any knowledge or at least suspicions that Barry Bonds was taking steroids? Uh, what do you think Mr. McGowan's lawyer meant when they, lawyers meant when they said that Mr. McGowan had misspoke? 
Mr. Chairman, I, uh, you know, as a, again, it's a matter under review, but it's a, it's a, uh, it's something that uh, I'll have to look into. But I can tell you right now, I've already started to look into it, and I will continue to. Well, this incident shows why it's important for baseball's management to take the problem of steroids seriously. It's possible that the Balco scandal could have been averted had Brian Sabian and Peter McGowan acted in a responsible fashion. Instead, they seemed more intent on protecting Barry Bonds. And it seems clear that Brian Sabian violated baseball rules by failing to report information about alleged steroid use to the commissioner's office. And Peter McGowan's answer to Senator Mitchell, Mitchell's questions don't seem to clarify his role at all. Uh, will uh, Sabian be sanctioned by your office? What about Mr. McGowan or the Giants organization? Well, I'm going to give you the same answer, and I think you'll understand okay. since I'm the judge that uh, it's one of many matters under review. Well, it's easy to blame the players for the entire steroid problem, but what the Mitchell report shows is that the blame runs much deeper. There was a culture throughout baseball that just looked the other way when it came to responding to reports of steroid use. I thank you for your uh, responses. Uh, Mr. McHenry? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I mean, to be honest with you, Mr. Chairman, I don't think that Congress's proper role is to mediate disputes between those that make tens of millions of dollars and those that make hundreds of millions of dollars. And to be honest with you, the substance of this hearing is really about the images that your players are sending to our youth. Uh, to be honest with you, you know, Conseco, um, McGuire, Sosa, Palmero, um, it's not really about their health and well-being we're talking about. We're talking about uh, the sanctity of the game that we love. But more importantly, the images we're sending to those kids in high school that want to be professional ball players, that seek it, that, that crave it, to look up these, to these guys as heroes. And so, you know, my questions are going to be about that, centered around that. And that's my main concern here is the images we're sending to our youth. I know there are questions about your social responsibility, but um, it goes beyond professional athletes. It goes beyond the Players Association and the owners. But <clears throat> the, the actions you took in 2005 were good. You, you have a tough testing program. We want to make sure it remains uh, strong. Uh, but it did take a long time for you to get there. Uh, my question to you, Mr. Fear, what responsibility does the Players Association have for the health and well-being of your members? I think um, for the health and well-being of our members, was that your question? I think um, a couple of things. Obviously, we're concerned about that. Obviously, it's our role to try and educate players as best we can. How do you educate them? You talk to them. You have doctors talk to them. You warn them. Do you have I, programs that do that? Yes, we have some, and we've already had, I think before you came into the room, some discussion <laughs> about the fact that we've had at least one meeting in which we've discussed enhancing that beginning early okay. this season. Okay. Do you think, Mr. Selig, Mr. Freer, your actions in 2005 have been enough? I'm sorry, that question. Do you think your actions in have 2005 been well, have been enough? We've made enormous progress. I, I do want to keep saying that because I enjoy But look, this is, this is a process evolving. I, I, we need to do more. We need, there are the things that I think that we can do. I think that we will, can do them together in some cases. And we, we need to expand our educational program. I, I, one of the things I have to say today that I, I'll never forget as long as I live is Donald Hooten's presentation with the Garibaldis. I, I sat over there and it, it, it stunned me, and I think uh, Mr. Hooten would tell you I called him the next morning. He didn't believe it was me, so we had to go through two minutes of that. But, but, um, mm -hmm. but the fact of the matter is <clears throat> our own people, it's a tough enough situation, and it attacks the integrity of the sport and everything else, but the message that we send is critical. And I, I have since talked to a lot of athletic directors, coaches, and football, and basketball and other sports and baseball and there's no question that we need to tighten this program and we need to continue to tighten this program and so okay. I, I agree you know I agree with uh, Senator Mitchell over and over this is an evolutionary thing and we can't rest because we don't know what else is out there right. and, and, and right. that's Mr. what Fear, we need to do. Um, why was the union so hesitant 
to allow the adoption of an anti-steroid policy. Uh, the Major League Baseball did it unilaterally with the minor leagues in 2001, and it took five years for there to be an effective testing policy to the point where you're quoting the newspaper, we're still in discussions. Why is that? Why, why did you hesitate adopting um, an anti-doping policy? Um, the question I think is more appropriately put, um, why did we oppose um, mandatory random testing prior to 2002, yeah, it seems like which we that, did. That is, which it, we did. And the reason why I, I've previously testified, I'll try and, and succinctly respond to your question today. I believed, players believed, that fundamental principles of probable cause bore a role here that before you did a search or invaded the privacy of an individual, you ought to have cause related to that individual to do that. It became apparent a year after or some months after the, the 2001 program was introduced in the minor leagues with the revelations about Ken Caminiti and so on in the spring of 2002, that that approach may have not been as well thought through as we thought it would. And as I testified at this committee in 2005, we had a lot of discussions and we decided that the best approach was to test it empirically. And we did a survey test. And the survey test came back significantly higher than I believed it would and certainly than I hoped it would. We then went to program testing. I thought at the time that the testing we had in effect in 2004 would probably have done the trick with respect to steroids. A lot of people didn't, including a lot of members of, of this committee, and so we took the additional steps. And since 2002, we have modified the agreement, sometimes formally, sometimes administratively, in a number of requests, in a number of different respects, including uh, recently, and I expect that to continue. Well, it, it, go ahead, Mr. Steele. Well, I just want to say the, the thing, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the virtues of the Mitchell Report for me was to point out again, even though we had done all these things, how much more we had to do, which answers your, your basic question, that, that uh, this thing is changing so rapidly that we, all, we not only will continue to do it, but we, got, we need to look forward and do more. Final comment. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, final uh, final you comment. Um, you need to think about the youth here and the images you're sending to them. And a final question for both of you, simple yes or no. Do you two feel complicit in the rise of steroid use in Major League Baseball? As I indicated in, in my testimony, we didn't pay enough attention to it soon enough. If that fits so your yes. definition of complicit, then the answer is yes. I said in my testimony, uh, my statement, and again today, I'll take responsibility. I take it for all the great things that have happened the last uh, 16 years. I'll certainly take it for that, and that's why I wanted the Mitchell Report because it would show me and show the people who come after me a roadmap of what maybe they should have done under the circumstance. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I, I'd like to commend both of you on the progress you've made, especially since our, our hearings. In my view, the most important uh, recommendation in Senator Mitchell's report is his recommendation, I'm going to, I'm going to quote him, uh, for uh, an entity with, quote, exclusive authority over all aspects of the formulation and administration of the drug program. Uh, Commissioner Selig, you mentioned in your testimony an independent um, program administrator. Um, I'd like to know what your version of an independent entity would look like, and to ask Mr. Fear if uh, uh, he, what, what his thoughts are concerning a completely uh, independent drug testing program. Well, I, I'll give my answer first. I, I think since we've been here, we we have gone. we more. We're much more independent. We have two of the gold standard labs uh, on the North American continent in Montreal and, U and UCLA. We have Dr. Brian Smith from the University of North Carolina, who um, Dr. Green had recommended to us. I, I think that everybody involved in the program will tell you that nobody 
has overturned any of his decisions, so he has been independent. It's a matter that we'll continue to review, but I think, uh, frankly, based on the results, and we've gone into it in very significant detail and surrounded these with the best labs and the best people whose, whose reputations are impeccable. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Smith, uh, I think if he were here today, would tell you that he has been independent, and it's up to us to make sure that he is. Mr. Peer. Thank you, um, Congresswoman. Um, let me begin by stating you know, something which is obvious to labor lawyers, but perhaps in this day and age isn't as well known. Under the law, we have the legal right, but more importantly, the responsibility to negotiate all terms and conditions of employment. You don't have to go. I taught labor that, law, Mr. Sell. I, I'm asking you a question. I apologize. What, what, because I'm aware of, of, I have great respect for collective bargaining, was one of the subjects I taught at Georgetown Law School. I'm asking what your views are on a completely. <laughs> it, it would appear so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what your views, your personal views are. However, you arrive at that, and you're talking about someone who respects the collective bargaining process, not somebody who thinks we or anybody over, ought to override it. What are your views Let me about try. a completely independent drug okay. testing program? Let me try again. Um, I believe that there should be an independent program administrator. We have one, as has been indicated. None of his recommendations have been other than complied with. Senator Mitchell indicated, and I agree with in his report, and I agree with it, that there are a number of different alternatives that might be considered the precise formula, formula that would be adopted needs to be decided in bargaining. I haven't closed yet and, and on the kinds of recommendations that I will make to the players as to what changes um, make sense. We do expect to get some proposals from the Commissioner's Office. Um, and we'll look at it in good faith and we'll let you know what we come up with. Well, I, I, I appreciate that answer. And by the way, I understand the position you're put in. I'm, I'm not asking you to, 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 to bargain uh, at the witness table. Uh, I do want to uh, indicate that you have a terrible burden, Mr. Fear, because you do represent players. There's no way for players to uh, feel good about uh, any kind of additional oversight. Uh, so I, I understand that entirely. Um, I appreciate uh, however, from your point of view, nothing would be better than to take this issue over the table, off the table. You want to talk about deterrent effect? Imagine the deterrent effect of knowing that an independent entity having nothing to do with anybody, not just doctors or scientists whom you trust, is who is going to conduct these random tests. Then the union does not have to worry about uh, grievances where they've got to represent the player no matter what. It's out of your hands. Uh, and um, therefore, I must ask you, what would be your objection to adopting the World and U.S. anti-doping uh, agency's standards uh, in baseball after all you've gone through just to get this off the table to imagine the effect of regaining almost instantly the credibility that baseball has lost the trust just in time for the Nationals to come to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think they would say they're already here, but we are having a new stadium. Um, let, let me just try and respond. I don't think my responsibilities are consistent with doing something just to get it off the table. Our responsibilities are to do two things. We have to negotiate what we think is a fair and appropriate program. Mr. Fear, I said deterrent effect. No, I understand. If, uh, if you and want to go to grievances to with players them. for the rest, <laughs> for, for, uh, for, uh, from I, here to kingdom come, then be my guest. Well, all I can tell you is that I believe we can and, and have and, and will continue to achieve that deterrent effect, and we'll see where these discussions take us. And I'm sure that this would committee. You, well, let me Ms. ask. Norton, let, let me ask Mr. Seelig if, if he would content, if, if he would at least consider a totally independent. I mean, that's one of the recommendations you said you supported all 20 recommendations. He knew what you all have just said to me. He knew about the vast improvement that you've already done, and still he said you needed a totally transparent, independent commission, Mr. Selig. What would be your response to at least considering that? Well, we still, as I, as I said expired, before, we but I'd like to let the witnesses answer the question. 
uh, her time has expired to ask questions, but we'd like to hear from your, okay, your response just, to the question. Um, I really believe, as I said to you earlier, that, that uh, this program is working in an independent way, but it's a, it's a very fair question and it's one we will closely evaluate because we need to be totally and completely independent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, the focus of this committee's work on baseball has mainly been with regards to its drug testing policy. But Senator Mitchell notes that improvements to the drug testing program by itself will not be sufficient and that the Commissioner's Office should place a higher priority on the in aggressive investigation of non-analytical evidence, that is, evidence of possession or use. Commissioner Selig, you acted quickly on this recommendation and I commend you for it because on Friday of last week you uh, appointed a new office of investigations for your office. Could you tell us the purpose of that office and, and what it's intended to do? I can. That was, um, I think Senator Mitchell found in the course of our history, uh, Congressman, that we um, uh, that we didn't have enough of a independent arm, so to speak, just doing investigation, which would help us uh, overall. So we've taken two people. One is a former uh, a deputy police chief in New York, the other an FBI man for over 30 years. They, they're here today. They have over 53 uh, years of experience in law enforcement. They are to track every possible rumor, every everything that's said on this subject so that that I can say to myself and to, to people in baseball and to all of you, we now have a department that will do nothing but that so that nothing escapes us and that, that will be their primary and really sole responsibility. Mr. Furr, let me ask you, uh, will the Players Association cooperate fully with this new office and, and urge players to do the same? One of the difficulties I have in responding is I don't yet know what the department is going to do. I don't know what techniques it's going to follow. It's my understanding that the protocols have not yet been developed. One of the things we've indicated to the commissioner we'd like to talk about is how is this going to work. We have developed, for example, procedures to handle investigations for the non-analytical positives that have resulted in suspensions the last several years. I don't know whether there will be differences or not. I can't evaluate it uh, until we look at that. Um, I certainly hope that we're going to be in a position to say at the end of the day that we'll represent our players in connection with any such investigations, but the investigations are going to be conducted in a way which does not suggest there are fundamental problems with it. We'll let you know. Earlier this morning, uh, Senator Mitchell indicated that he did have some faith and confidence that baseball would be able to adequately police itself. Could the t two of you tell me what, as a team, that you expect to do that you have not already done that's going to vindicate this kind of faith that the uh, Senator expressed? Well, um, I, in, in the case of the department, these people's sole responsibility really will be to investigate all these things. They won't have to go through layers of people. I think the senator was a little bit troubled by that. There are people with, as I said, uh, 53 years of law enforcement experience so that they, they, will be, they will not only be in touch with all the d law enforcement departments everywhere and all of our, where all our franchises are, but here in Washington and everything else, and that is their job now, and it is a big one, so that we can never again say, well, we didn't know, or this guy told this guy something else, or labor said this to security, and security said this. That's it. They'll report to Mr. DuPay, the president of Major League Baseball, directly, and there will be no question about it. And as I said, both of these very well-trained people will, be, will do nothing but follow this subject in every way, shape, form, and manner. Uh, Congressman, in all the years I've been in baseball and in the 30-odd years I've known the commissioner, I don't think anybody has ever previously referred to us as a team, either actual or, <laughs> or potential. Um, and, no, and nor, so will, nor will they again, probably. 
<laughs> and given the conflicting uh, uh, interests that our relative constituencies have, especially on the economic matters, uh, and the, the uh, adversarial nature of the collective bargaining process that our law enshrines, um, uh, it may not happen again. Mr. Selig may, may be right. All I can tell you is this. Since the strike in 94-95, which was horrible and ugly and ended as a result of a, an injunction, as a result of unfair labor practices, and then it took a long time to get an agreement afterwards, um, there's been a change in the relationship. We were able to reach agreements in 2002 and in 2006, although not without difficulty, but without stoppages and without, last time around, threats of stoppages. We have been able to negotiate um, agreements dealing with performance enhancing drugs and to amend those a number of times, both administratively um, and formally. What, what I can tell you is that we should be in a position to cooperate where we can. Um, where we can't, where the constituencies differ, I assume that we'll have to work those out. That's the nature of bargaining. But the object is to cooperate where we can and minimize the areas of dispute. For my part, I had a long time with a lot of disputes with Major League Baseball. I'm willing to have another one if we have to. That's far from my first choice. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I just hope that you can find enough common ground to, to protect and preserve not only the integrity of the game, but also to promote the public interest and send the right signals and the right messages to our young people. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Thank Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding the hearing. You all have been very patient, and you'll be glad to know you're getting towards the end here. Um, I'm highly sensitized to this issue recently for a couple reasons. One is I, I uh, a few weeks back, introduced legislation that would create a foundation to support the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Education, which I hope will take the lead with others in a campaign nationally that we have to undertake uh, to combat the use of steroids. But in the process, I, I've been visiting a lot of, of youth sports programs and so forth around my district over the last few weeks just to uh, promote uh, the mission of the President's Council and you know, have seen firsthand obviously the impact that professional athletes have. I mean, the, the posters that are on the walls, the comments of the kids. And so the effect um, that that modeling has on them is, is, I think, obvious to all of us. The other thing is a little thing that happened yesterday. Um, my 14 year old son loves baseball, He's, uh, he wants to play baseball. He's been playing it, um, so I thought I'd help him get in shape for the baseball season that's coming up. And I went out and bought him one of these, um, these uh, uh, push-up things where it's a, there's a piece of equipment, there's a tape that comes with it. So last night we went down to watch the tape. Seemed innocent enough. Um, but at the end of it, the, the person on the, on, the, on the videotape said, so what you need is three things. You need the equipment. You need this instruction booklet on how to make sure your form is good. And then, of course, you need these supplements that you can go buy, too. So that pretty much drove it home. This was, this was last night at 9 o'clock. So I was, I was ready for the hearing just based on that. Um, there seem to be three categories of, of, of athletes um, that we're talking about. One are those who are not using any performance-enhancing drugs, and, and uh, it sounds like it requires quite a bit of discipline to resist it. Um, the, the second group would be those who are doing it and don't care. I mean, they've just decided that, that it's all about the detection. If they can escape detection, they will, and they'll use these, these, uh, these uh, drugs to get, to get uh, competitive advantage. And then I think there's a group in the middle, which has been described, which are, which are the athletes who say, you know, I don't want to do this. But if I'm losing out competitively to, to these other folks who aren't being taken to task, I'm not just going to sit idly by. And so they get pulled into it. Yeah. And what I'm curious about is, is how can we move the culture away from this notion that you don't do it because you don't want to be detected, which leaves you open to the arrival of new non-detectable drugs to sort of undermine the effort. How can we get to a culture of clean? I mean, do you have any confidence that the enforcement mechanisms that, you're, that you've implemented and will agree to implement further going forward can actually lead to that so that those who don't use and those who don't want to use but are 
can, can take over the game in a positive way and drive that culture. So it's not about whether you're getting detected or not. It's about doing the right thing. I don't want to sound naive about it, but can we get to that point where that's the sort of cultural norm? How much confidence do you have in that? Both well, I, I, I would say that, that I have a lot more confidence than I did three years ago. Um, all of our educational programs um, that go out, w w baseball uh, with the Partnership for Drug-Free America and the Hooten Foundation and others has spent an enormous amount of time and money, and I th we're getting the message across. Now, with all the internal things we're doing in baseball to change the culture, and I think the culture has been changed in a lot of ways, maybe even more than we know, but I would hope that all the things that we've done Take, just think all the things in the last week, the Mitchell recommendations about certifying from trainers and checking packages and doing all the things we do, this deport, uh, the, uh, the new department, which I think is going to be very important. I think today everybody in the sport, and I'm talking on the field and off the field, has a much clearer understanding that this culture not only needs to be changed, is changing, and is changing dramatically. We just got to keep the pressure on, to be frank with you. Yes, I'm optimistic that we can do that, and in fact, I don't, we have to do it. We have no other choice. This must be done. I guess for my part, um, I hope we can. I think we're moving and have made some big strides in that direction. I have no doubt that this or other committees of the Congress will be interested in whether history proves out that we have, and we'll see. Our task is to keep working at it. But let me address one thing you said, which to me is of really enormous importance. You talked about your son seeing a video that said he should take supplements. If any of you haven't done it, please go to the drugstore or GNC or somewhere else and look what's up on the shelves. Every tree, every grass, every bush, every mineral, every, everything else anybody's ever heard of is there. When I mentioned in my prepared testimony in my opening remarks that one of the things that may bear consideration is a review of the Dietary Supplements Act, DSHEA, to see if it makes sense so that we don't, in effect, advertise to kids. Because, as Senator Mitchell has said, as Commissioner has said, as I've said any number of times, this is a very wide problem. And I'll just give you one example of it. I'll hand it up to the committee when we're done. This is an ad for Continental Airlines magazine that we saw coming down here. It says, choose life, grow young with HGH, the reverse aging miracle. Okay? Um, it is one thing to say that athletes should do whatever they can, and we don't question that. But if the messages generally are not consistent with that, especially to kids, we got a really tough road to hoe. And so I hope that people would consider that. I, I just, just uh, yeah. uh, you know, the public service uh, announcement that we, that we are doing with the Partnership for Drug Free America, which shows what it does to, to people's bodies, that needs to be go on at every level. As I said earlier, I've talked to a lot of people in, uh, in uh, college sports and high school sports and other things, and there is no question, and hopefully out of all this, baseball can be a leader in, in, in doing exactly what you're asking, and that is to send the right message. Thank you. If I could just make, I, I apologize and ask your indulgence for 30 more seconds. Um, if you go to young people's athletic programs, one of the messages you will see most consistently delivered in any variety of ways will be, you're not big enough, you're not strong enough, you're not fast enough. Do something about it. And the kids want to. In wrestling, we approach this in different ways. We have things like weight classes. We don't otherwise. If the message is going to be in the main competitive team sports that most people are not big enough, strong enough, or fast enough, that makes it even more difficult. And I haven't got a clue as to how to attack that, because that's what the coaches want. Thank you. My time is up. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. I would just say that uh, I hope that the, the public watching is watching not just as fans of baseball, but also does some self-reflection as, as parents and coaches and thinks about the messages that we're sending and how we can participate in this campaign to turn around.
uh, steroid use. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sarbanes and, and Mr. Selig, Mr. Fear. I, I thank you so much for your you. patience and your willingness to be here. Senator Mitchell described a pretty sad and in many ways depressing history of baseball in the era of steroids, but he also laid out a road map. And I appreciate the fact that both of you are willing to consider those recommendations and that road map so that we can get beyond where baseball has been in the past. I think you've made progress, but we still have a ways to go. Uh, but I thank you very much for your, your leadership, you. your efforts, and uh, I hope uh, we can hear continued good, word, good news from both of you about thank this you. subject. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we close, I want to ask unanimous consent to put in the record a statement uh, 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 by the memorials. Uh, if, I, if it's not already in the record, uh, we want to be sure that they are able to put uh, their statement uh, in, in the record on behalf of the Efrain Anthony Marrero Foundation. Without objection, that will be the order. That concludes our business today. We stand adjourned. As you just saw, the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee held a hearing today to consider an investigative report led by former Senator